arcade heroes. Greetings, it's Adam with ArcadeHeroes.com, and I wanted to thank everybody who watched this video here. How does pinball do in a regular arcade in 2022? As it received a pretty strong response, a lot stronger than I was expecting. As I'd done several other videos where I was presenting some information from the perspective of an arcade operator, such as how to arcade operators decide what to buy, how do retro video arcade games do in a regular arcade these days, shipping, arcade machines, stuff like that. But out of all of those, the pinball one has garnered the most attention. And because of that, with, especially with all of the comments that have popped up, with it currently being at 155, and yes, some of those do apparently count my responses. Uh, still, there were just so many comments, some questions, some criticisms that felt like it would be a good idea to do a follow-up on this, but I've been going back and forth on how to do that exactly just because it's kind of a complex subject. And so, or particularly with the many different points of view that are out there. And so, the impression that I have been getting overall is that I need to provide a little bit more context on my situation here in Utah, maybe reiterate some things that I mentioned in that video as there were several points that people brought up that I did mention, but it's possible you didn't watch the entire video. I know it was pretty long, and so I'll front load that this time, and then I'll also provide some thoughts from other arcade operators as I've reached out to numerous colleagues in the business, many of which have been doing this longer than I have, and many of them have dealt with pinball as well, and at least what I've found from the feedback I've received so far is that it's fairly unanimous that the, the use of pinball in the arcade isn't this major money maker. And so let's back that up with some more. Now, first off, context. Now, Arcade Heroes is a news blog that was started in 2006. And I, it's not the same thing as my arcade. My arcade, and let me throw up my sort of arcade industry resume here. It was originally started in 2008, um, about a year and a half after Arcade Heroes started. And it was called Game Grid Arcade. It had to change the name to Arcade Galactic in 2020, but I joined Arcade Heroes in 2007 as a writer, but I gained ownership of the site in 2010, and I've been just writing about it ever since. And so in the early days of YouTube, you weren't able to really have the multiple channels on one account sort of thing, but later on they added that. Uh, so early on I was posting things from both my arcade as well as Arcade Heroes here on the same channel, but when I was able to separate them out, I've tried to keep them as separate as I can so as to not confuse people, but also keep Arcade Heroes focused on its main objective, which has been to spread the good word of arcade and pinball machines and other out-of-home entertainment amusements. Whereas for the Game Grid Arcade, or now Arcade Galactic channel, I want to keep that just focused on local stuff for the arcade, as it doesn't make sense for me to be doing a worldwide promotion on a local small business. Now, I also used to sell arcade equipment, which included pinball machines, but the reason why I'm bringing this all up is where I started writing and really following the news on things like pinball back in 2007, and also was researching it for my own business when I first started, and of course doing the sales. I've seen how pinball has evolved from just being one company of Stern Pinball, the only manufacturer back in those days to several manufacturers, Jersey Jack Pinball, Spooky Pinball, American Pinball, Pinball Brothers, Dutch Pinball, etc. And so it's really exploded over really the past 10 years or so. 
because uh, that's when it was 2012 or 2013 around there when Jersey Jack came out with the Wizard of Oz and started creating some competition in the field again and what I've really noticed and I've also heard this from the manufacturers too is just that the home users interested in pinball it's very very strong and I know for manufacturers they sell a lot of equipment to the home market even though really the game is supposed to be designed to go into a commercial space first but because that is such a big market, they have to try and figure out how to appeal to both sides. And what you also might notice is just that the hype behind pinball, the discussion online, tends to be a lot stronger than it is for video arcade games. Video arcade games, most people seem more interested in just talking about older games and not so much the newer stuff, as I run plenty of stories on brand new video arcade games and it gets almost no traction um, but you will see something about pinball out there and while well, not necessarily on my blog but there's so many other blogs and podcasts and forums that discuss newer pinball machines where there's just a lot of enthusiasm there or you look at the social media following of companies like Stern Pinball and all the others that I mentioned where they just ha seem to have a lot more interaction and followers and interest than a company like Raw Thrills or Sega Amusements or Bandai Namco America Amusements and the latter two would be the arcade divisions of each and not the home console ver uh, divisions. And so when you see that the hype is real and there the question is, well, does that really translate into earning well on location? And as I shared in that previous video, well, no, not really. That's at least from what I've seen. Now, let me back it up a little bit more with some data from colleagues, but also just to point out a little bit more about my business here and what maybe makes my situation unique or why I do things the way that I do. First off, I'm in a mall. And so, as you can kind of see here, and this is early opening, haven't turned everything on yet. Just, I like to save power. But, and so if somebody comes in and wants to play something, I can turn more stuff on. But in a mall, your main thrust of earnings is going to come from foot traffic. If the mall's busy, I'm busy. If there's a new movie release and there's a bunch of people walking the mall because there is a movie theater just down the hall from me and they don't have an arcade, and then I'm going to be busy too. In fact, all my best days have coincided with big movie releases. And so that's one aspect of it. Another very important aspect, probably more important, is where I'm located. And so this photo right here is of downtown Salt Lake City, Utah. And Apart from snow, one thing we're also known for are Mormons. Now, I've been born and raised in Utah. I belong to the Mormon faith, but the official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And one of the tenets of the faith is abstaining from alcohol. It's part of what's called the Word of Wisdom. And between that and the fact that there are a lot of people that live here which belong to the Mormon faith, it's meant that we have a culture and we also have a have different laws which are not very favorable towards drinking alcohol. Now they have loosened that up a little bit in recent years just because of all the tourists that like to come and drive up into the mountains and go skiing and going to places like Park City and all that but it's still pretty restrictive compared to most other states in the U.S. We also have some of the strictest anti-gambling laws in the United States. I think Hawaii is the only other one that is as strict as Utah is. Now another, and just I guess to kind of drive that home point really quick, just because I was thinking about this this week, is here's a, or I keep pointing the wrong way, Here's a photo of a grocery store. This is from a Trader Joe's in downtown Salt Lake City. And this is pretty typical of what you'd see in grocery stores of the alcohol section. The only thing that they serve is beer. And I know that there is a 
limit on to how much alcohol content can be sold at a grocery store, and it, I believe it's the lowest amount that can be sold in stores, but it's only beers that they sell. If you want anything else, wines even, you have to go to the state liquor store. And so it's just also tied into, there's just not a lot of bars here. Now, along with that too, is the fact that Utah has long been a champion, I guess you could say, of having the highest rate birth rate in the United States out of all 50 states. And at least from a quick search on Google in 2021, Utah was by far the highest in number of births that uh, is in the country. And so that means you have a lot of kids. So when you have a culture that doesn't really look at favorably on drinking alcohol, and then you also have a ton of children in the area, and there's new ones all the time, does it really make any sense for you to do a bar arcade? Now, granted, like I mentioned, there are some out there, but it's really limited as to what success they're going to find just because you're going to be up against just some hard facts that a lot of your potential market's not going to drink and a lot of your potential market can't even legally enter into your space. <laughs> and so between those two things, it's just never made sense to me to go and do a bar arcade sort of thing. And so uh, there was a comment from somebody who said they're in, uh, in Australia. And I actually had, I talked to a colleague who is in Australia and, and on WhatsApp, and he mentioned in his comment there that the in Australia the best venues sell beer, not real beer, micro beer, and modern vegan food, etc. Very expensive, and the machines do the attraction, not the income. And so he's, I think what he's saying there is the income really comes from alcohol sales, and that does seem to be what one of the comments were we're getting to um, but let and this is Les Doyle he's mainly done sales for arcades but he says that he's operated pinball machines as well but he mentions how so many pinball machines makes absolutely no money and that the one that's the breakout is Deadpool which for some reason earns three to five times everything else probably because it's uh, what they, you would call a rude machine but it's as he says, it's so rare to find a pinball that does more than 20 to $40 a week. And that would also imply even in a bar situation. Now, he also brought up time cards. And he said that it'll beat $1 coins as you make them give you $10 per a lot of time. So you win, still chasing your tail to beat people who look at pinball and don't play. It's a museum tour while drinking beer. Now put that up against what I just mentioned with Utah's not real drinking culture and if you come here yes there are bars but it's not everywhere in fact between where I work here and my house I don't know of any bar uh, it's about a 10 sometimes 15 minute drive just depending on traffic but still I and I could take multiple routes to get back home and there's no bars <laughs> in that distance um, now downtown Salt Lake City does have a few and there are actually are some bar arcades here in the valley there's quarters arcade bar which actually just opened a second location in a area called Sugar House which is an area of Salt Lake City um, actually, down the hall from me, there's a giant FEC that they have a section called Pins and Ales. However, they have very, very few arcade games there. It's more just a bar. Um, last I checked, they just had a Golden Tee, a Big Buck Wild, and three pinball machines. Interestingly enough, they opened with four, and they got rid of one. It must have meant that it didn't earn very well. And then, of course, downtown Salt Lake City, you have um, Dave and & Buster's, and about... 15 minutes south of this mall where I'm at, there is a location called Round One USA, where I'm also, as far as I'm aware, they also serve alcohol. The last time I was there, they also only had four pinball machines, whereas they have hundreds of other games, video games, crane machines, ticket redemption games, and all that. Now, if pinball was a major earner, and these, and even when these venues that sell alcohol, 
then you would see more of it. But when something doesn't earn, that's why you don't see it. And that's just the way it is. And you can make excuses for saying, well, Dave & Buster's is different. Well, they still serve alcohol, so why isn't the magic working to make people ma suddenly gravitate towards dumping tons of money into pinball? It's because it just doesn't sell itself. And that is the point I was really trying to make in the last video, was that, it, well, one commenter said, you think that there is a problem with pinball or pinball is the problem with your business. And I didn't say that. I said it has a problem and that problem is selling itself. And so one example to that. So sitting right over here, you have some arcade video racing games. And then, of course, over there where you have pinball machines. Now, if you... Uh, let's you have to try and put your shoes in to somebody who's never visited an arcade before like when you were a child maybe the first time that you visited an arcade when you see something like a racing game you instantly know what you're going to do you are going to race if you see a light gun game you know you're gonna shoot something but when you see a pinball machine and again this is assuming you've never seen one before and you've never played one before do you know in instantly and intuitively what you're going to do with that? No, you don't. And that's not an excuse, that's not a delusion as one insulting commenter said. It's just an objective fact that pinball doesn't make instant sense unless you already know what it is where somebody explains it to you. And so that's one reason why it's a lot easier for video arcade games to have that appeal and to actually earn better whereas pinball it just again when you approach most modern pinball machines as I pointed out in the last video you have these rule cards that have tons of tiny text on them for all the different rules and you have all these things on the play field and again it doesn't necessarily make instant sense to somebody who's never seen it before what you're supposed to do and I've had multiple people in both of my locations ask me what is this what's the point of it how how do I play and, but again I've never really had that happen with a with any video arcade game uh, other than something that's really esoteric and doesn't make sense you know that where it's just say buttons uh, or a joystick and buttons but the game itself is kind of strange but you know those are exceptions to the rule whereas pinball machines while the themes change and the designs the layouts change it, it, it's still the basic concept of you have a ball and you're hitting it with two bats and you're trying to get as many points as you can now that itself is fairly simple but again it's not presenting itself like that and so if you haven't grown up with it if somebody hasn't explained it to you it's not explaining itself and so to me that's what a big problem is with it and that's the reason why it doesn't seem to really bring home the bacon now let me back this up with some additional data so I reached out to a, an arcade operator in Nevada and I've done business with them and they're, they're good friends and his uh, this is from his son who currently runs the business his dad started running it back in the 1970s and so this is, these are numbers from his pinball machines across various what we call routes. A route is where you have games in all sorts of locations. It could be a restaurant, a bar, a movie theater, lobby, or a game room area, a gas station, rest stop. You know, really anywhere, that, that's one nice advantage about arcade machines is in any other type of business where there's a waiting area space, you can put games in there and generate a little extra income and most people don't realize that a vast majority of the what are called arcades out there are these routes and last number I had seen which was from 2015 said there were over hundred and sixty thousand routes in the United States and so there that's where there's a significant reach uh, or potential for reach for arcades pinball machines out there and so here's his numbers from January 2022 to today, ACDC at a bar, which he also says is a great jukebox account. A lot of routes do rely on jukeboxes to bring in income. 
Uh, it's made $238.75 over seven months. And that's in a bar. And again, the conventional wisdom is if it's in a bar drenched in alcohol, then it's going to make tons of money. Well, $238 over that course of time isn't really that much money. Ghostbusters LE averaged $96 every week. Two weeks before I pulled it in January, placed at a bowling alley. He replaced that with a Godzilla Premium, which may has made $859.25. Decent, but keep in mind, Godzilla Premiums are somewhere around eight to $9,000, not including shipping, tax, any of that stuff. Jurassic Park Pro, $716.50 at a pizza parlor. The Pirates of the Caribbean by Stern, which was 2005-2006. $259.50, and that's at a movie theater. Jackbot, $229 at a casino arcade, and it's next to a Scared Stiff, which made $592, so that one's actually doing pretty well. So on average, I get $97 per drop of a pen. And so those numbers really aren't that far off from what I see. And one thing to note is that brand new games do tend to make more. This is also somewhat typical of video games too. They'll start off at some high point and then they descend and then they hit some sort of average and they just kind of coast there. And so it applies to pinball too. Now he added this takeaway. So in my experience, and this is the same for my dad with his 40 years of experience, pinball never does well as other games. Even back in the peak arcade days, pinball was always there just to change things up, add a little flavor to the arcade, but it was never the draw or the money maker. In my arcades today, all street locations, small FECs and casinos, stuff like that, I use pinballs to break up the monotony of toy cranes and merchandisers. They never do great, usually always at the bottom of the collection, when collection is a term us operators usually use to say the money that we collect from the machines. But they add something to the game room that nothing else can. I agree. Whether that has a value or not, I don't know. I do think they do. Uh, in my main takeaway from pinball now is that it's more of an investment piece. I bought a Godzilla Premium before I, I even took it out of the box. I could have turned around and sold it for over 3000 over what I paid. Granted, I won't do that because I love pinball and I will most likely pull it off the route in a few years and add it to my personal collection. It is my best earning pin at the moment, but I used it to pull a Ghostbusters LE off my route that has appreciated in value to a point where it didn't make sense to let it stay out and get beat up by the general public anymore. Because yeah, if it gets beat up too much, then it's going to lose some of that resale value. Now. Did pins used to make money? Well, yeah, there was one commenter on the last video who said that during the 70s, part of my mechanics job in a bowling center was to uh, assemble new pinball machines and repair them. Chicago Coin was a POS. <laughs> uh, on the back of the machine was a price board where you could set the plays per a quarter. There was a place for our usual three games for a quarter or a place for 50 cents a game. We thought that was insane for the time. In the late 70s, our eight machines brought in over 1,000 a week, and that was in Joyzy. So, um, going back to Les Doyle from Australia, and just to reiterate there, where he said that it's rare to find a pinball that does more than 20 to $40 a week, and that's in a culture that is heavy on the bar scene. And so, it's, yeah, from all the things that I've been able to gather from other arcades out there it's it's not just not a big money maker and now uh, I also asked this uh, Nevada operator's father his name's Russ and he gave me a little bit more info to, uh, let me read he sent me a text and saying ask the question why don't pinballs why don't they earn better the only reason I operated pinballs throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s is because of several reasons. Obviously, I was always a pinhead. I can't overemphasize that enough. But they always attracted a different demographic. A different group of players always wanted pinball. And these players, unfortunately, tended to play longer than typical video gamers or quick coin redemption games. Now, that's important because the more time you can spend on a machine without putting more money into it, the less it earns. And now reason number one, pinball has never earned as good as video. 
However, there was a silver lining. By keeping dad entertained longer, the kiddos played video games longer. So even though you didn't see the benefit in the pinballs cash box, we always felt there was a benefit there and you touched on that in your video. That's what I like to call indirect income or maybe a better term for it would be indirect attraction. So the, the pinballs do bring some people in, but oftentimes uh, during every day that I'm here, uh, I don't often see people just by themselves. I mean, sometimes, yeah, but they're usually with somebody else. And so in a group, you're always going to have different tastes. And so sometimes pinball may be one thing that draws somebody in, so they want to stick around and then the other people see other stuff that they're interested in and so it just it, it's a benefit still and so I'm again I'm not dumping on pinball and this is one reason why I have it it's just again it's not this huge money maker and if I ever implied that well I, that's my mistake I did not mean to imply it I mean when I started back in 2008 I only had two pinball machines a Shrek and an Indiana Jones by Stern and I didn't get another pinball machine until 2013 when the Stern Star Trek came out as I was impressed enough with the premium model that I decided to expand on that. But it would still be another few years before I would expand even further. But the reason why I was decided to expand was I was noticing that certain people who were really into pinball, they kept asking for more machines and I also noticed that on the ones that we had, they would tend to spend more time and a little bit more money, but they would also be bringing in these groups. So we decided, well, let's see how we can get more pinball in here and see what that does. Now, what I've done to do so is I've not necessarily invested a ton into pinball myself. I've been working with operators, uh, other route operators, where these ones for each location are mainly focused just on pinball machines and they don't really do other types of games. They might, but for the most part they're, say, renting out pinball machines that they own to people who have a house and want to rent pinball for a while but don't want to put that huge investment into buying a brand new one, or an old one even. And so at this location where I'm at now, out of the eight machines that I have, I actually only own three of them. And at my other location, I only own four of the 10 that I think that are currently there. And so am, am I banking all my business on pinball? Am I trying to be the hit pinball hall of fame? No, but I wholeheartedly agree with, um, with, with these operators here who there is a reason to have it around, but it, there's just no reason for me to convert all of my arcade over to it. Now, Back to the question of the entry fee thing, because several of you commenters brought this up and said, you know, you, this is what you should do to make pinball worthwhile. Now, keep in mind, other than being in a mall, for me to convert over to that, it would be an expense. I would have to move the front desk. I would have to find a way to kind of section everything off at the front so that I couldn't have people just wandering in and start playing free play games. I, I would have to be able to corral them, so to speak, to be able to get them to pay for that. Now, Russ did a pine on this uh, where I asked him, do you think there's more value to pins in an entry, free, entry fee slash free play situation versus coin drop or no? And he responded, I'm not sure. It might increase revenue from good players who can keep a game going for long stretches and could allow new players a better chance to learn pinball? Question mark. It could also backfire, allowing good players to dominate the tables, not giving newbies a chance to play. Pinball might be less intimidating to new players with an entry fee instead of pay per game, though. You, and then responding to me, he says, you have a very unique situation since you are there in the arcade more often than most operators. Use that advantage, maybe try one day a week of this fee sort of thing. Play around with different ideas, see what works. Bottom line for him is try to get more pinheads in your area. Increasing the fan base by educating new players is playing the long game and results may take years to quantify. I'm just not certain I know a guaranteed method to do it other than becoming the local pinball hangout in your area. And he also suggested or he 
threw out the question how to improve pinball earnings, where he stated, players who are unfamiliar with pinball think they are strictly a game of chance, not skill, as you mentioned in your video. I don't know if that will ever change. One way to possibly help is to educate new players. In your situation, it might work to offer special learn pinball classes to newbies. It could be a quick class of one half price game of pinball on the table of their choice. You play the first ball and talk through your shots, teaching them simple things like not to hit both flippers at the same time and more difficult shots, rule sets as well as some fun stories about the history of pinball. The second ball they could play while you help talk them through what they should be doing. I know from experience this tactic worked for me regarding home sales to potential pinball buyers and I think it could translate to educating pinball players. Pinball manufacturers have been trying their damnedest to educate new players by making the first ball easy to learn but also walking that fine line of keeping the pinheads happy with deeper rule sets with limited success. I don't think there's much else they can do to attract new players unfortunately. Obviously a good license helps get the first play but for newbies that never guarantees the next. Now, um, kind of going back really quick to the free play sort of thing. So here's one arcade that does do that, where it's an entry fee sort of thing. And notice how big of an emphasis they put on pinball. And this is called The Arcade. They're in Wichita, Kansas. And they stated that... Um, well, you'll notice there, cheap pinball, only 50 cents. So all the video games are on free play, but they charge for the pinball machines. And I've also seen that happen here locally. There is a an arcade north of me, about 40, 45 minutes, called Flynn's Retrocade. They do the same thing, charge for their pinball machines. Um, we have a few different competing places here in, in Utah called, where there's one called Nickelcade, there's another called Nickelmania, there's another called Nickel City. Out of all those Nickelmania, the owner is very much into pinball, but they have an entry fee and then all the games are on nickels. Although Nickelmania did recently switch over to a card system, so I guess the points that they do are the same value as nickels. But either way, um, it's interesting to me that a lot of these free play places still charge for pinball. Now, I asked the owner or the part owner of the arcade. His name is Derek Sorrells, and this is what he stated about that in response to my own inquiry into this. And so he said, we do free play on everything but pinball, skee ball, and Pac-Man Battle Royale. We charge 50 cents primarily to cover repair costs and make a few bucks. However, skee ball does four times per unit than any pinball. Now, why is that? Is skee ball complicated? Do, do people not know what to do with skee ball? Nope. They, anybody who sees a skee ball, it's just like seeing an arcade racer. It's a simple enough game where uh, you know all you have to do is throw the ball into the, um, or roll the ball and try and get it into the targets, get as many points as you can. And I know of people who play it just for fun, not just for the ticket side of it, too. Now, granted, skee ball's been around in that it's playable form longer than pinballs have had flippers but still it's just been something that's been able to exist without needing somebody to train other people on it now to Russ's point and to others who also suggested that I run education seminars uh, is and looking at some other comments on the video uh, there was a Paul Kamau who also suggested that I do something to what Russ mentioned, casually leave credits on machines and promote that, uh, teach him how to play, uh, or do a pinball happy hour. He also suggested I move pin the machines next to the front desk, although that's actually something we already do uh, at both locations, uh, in part so that I can actually help people out. And the operator that I work with also suggested doing a happy hour sort of thing. So that is something that I have been meaning to try and will attempt. It's just the one issue I have with being able to educate people is that 
generally while I'm here, uh, it's uh, except for times like this in the early mornings where it's dead. Uh, you know, if it's busy, I just can't do that it, because I have to be helping people up here running cards or other games have a problem where I have to keep an eye on things. And so if I can and I notice that somebody's having a problem, then I will go and you know give them some very quick pointers. It's just really to do that effectively, I would have to hire somebody to essentially be a pinball carnival barker and, and teacher and, and preferably somebody who's better at the game than I am. Just the issue is, would that really be worth the money? As Russ mentioned, it's a long game that you would have to play and but it's also impossible to know if the risk and in the investment into having somebody do that would be worth the reward now recently i did have a local player here so here in salt lake we have this organization the known as slap or the salt lake area pinballers and they have been doing something that a lot of people suggested oh you should be doing events and tournaments we have been um, for as long as we've had more than five machines we've been doing that and that's been in conjunction with this slap group but there was one player who saw this video that I did and not long after that he came in he had the idea of doing a pinball team building exercise with some of his coworkers. And so he was able to get approval to do that. And so they came in for three or four hours on an afternoon. And he did exactly what Russ and some others were suggesting I do. He taught his coworkers how to play pinball. Now, whether or not uh, those guys have come back here, I'm not 100% sure. He, I recognize because I've seen him plenty of times, talked with him, but uh, I don't remember his, uh, his co-workers faces but yeah it, it I guess it's more effective if locations like mine can have pinball players doing that educating for them. you guys are the missionaries so to speak <laughs> of the the spreading the, the gospel of pinball out there and can that be effective I think so it just it's something that's difficult to quantify and I think it is more effective if pinball players themselves are the ones that are bringing people in rather than relying on locations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, most locations out there are routes. They don't have an attendant around. It's just a game room, and you've probably visited one before. Um, or if there is an attendant, they, it, it's usually just too difficult for them to be able to go out and sell pinball to people. And so, um, I do think it's a great idea. I do agree with it. There was another commenter, Alucard2089, who suggested make a big card to explain how to play. And I do like that idea, as it's you know kind of a, a way to do so. I've actually tried a smaller card uh, that we did at our other location where we were just encountering so many people who were audibly stating out loud, what is this, what, what is pinball, how do I play this? And so we did make some smaller cards, but we should have made some bigger ones. Just was trying to figure out a way to do it without it, the signs covering the pinball machines themselves. And so uh, that is something that I will look at doing is that might be kind of a static way to go about it. You know, with, with tournaments can also be that sort of thing too. I've act, We've had instances where tournaments are going on and that just creates kind of an instant attraction as other people who are just wandering through the mall uh, see that and then they're like, oh, hey, what's this going on? And then I've seen where the tournament players may allow somebody who's not in the tournament to just play on the machine and they may give them pointers and stuff like that. And that is actually something that wouldn't happen as dynamically or as often if I was on a entry fee sort of thing just because again with that you're not getting those people who may just come in and spend a dollar or two and then leave and to that point the reason why I also stick with this in at least in this location and my other is that when it comes to sustaining the business and the the, the insulting comment uh, sounded 
absolutely mystified and baffled how I've been able to sustain my business. He kept proclaiming, even though he admitted he was an outsider and doesn't know what the numbers are, the whole situation, uh, but he kept proclaiming that, oh, there, there's no way this is sustainable. Now, again, it's not my main thrust of my business. The, may, the, the way I run my business is I have brand new video games, um, old video games, retro video games, if you want to call them that. I have some sports games like basketball machines, air hockey, foosball, and I have a couple of what we call prize merchandisers. Those actually aren't mine. They're from operators, so that way I don't have to worry about the costs of getting the new prizes. But that mixture is what I have used to keep my business going for 14 years. And again, pinball has never been the foundation of my business. The foundation has mainly been the brand new video games. Now, in an entry fee sort of situation, getting brand new video games doesn't really make a lot of sense because of how much they cost. Uh, before the pandemic, the average price was maybe $7,500 a game. Post pandemic and all these crazy supply issues and production issues and inflation, the average price has shot up to like ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a game. And so the brand new Fast and Furious that was announced by Raw Thrills just a month ago, that's $25,000 for a single sit down racing unit. And whereas Normally, those used to be 7,500 or between seven to 8,000. And so, putting in an entry fee thing, while it spreads the earnings around and whatnot, it holds back return on investment, ROI. And in this situation, with the coin drop situation, games that are brand new that are good can pay themselves off very quickly so the game that you can see on the camera here cruise and blast i that was for the pair it was somewhere around fourteen thousand dollars maybe fifteen after shipping and taxes it paid itself off in five and a half months and now that would not have happened if i was doing an entry fee because where did a lot of that come from people that may have just come here just to play that and just put a few bucks in that but enough there was enough of volume of that because of the foot traffic that it was able to pay itself off so quickly but when you are on an entry fee people want to know everything that you got to offer first before they decide, well, I'm going to buy an hour pass or I'm going to buy an all day pass. And so it just creates a very different dynamic. And another thing too, is that all these games have been designed with the coin drop model in mind. They weren't designed as a free play model. The free play model is more of a thing that would fit better for console games because then you can just spend as much time as you want. Whereas these games are designed to essentially get people in and out, but provide as much fun as possible within that short amount of time that they're playing it. And so even if you think it's an archaic model, that's still how brand new video games are designed. And really that's still kind of how pinball games are designed. It's just they've gotten a little bit more complex than they used to be. Now, um, for some other comments that I saw, one user pop-up photographer suggested that I have a couple of easier or beginner machines set up centrally and so I do have a space shuttle and wouldn't be I, I do like that idea I, I kind of do that already but probably with some better signage I guess part of the problem is that I've noticed is signs we've tried so many signs and people don't read them <laughs> but also particularly in this location over the past five years I have had an explosion in the local population or in my customer base of Hispanics and I get people every day who don't really speak English uh, it's not their first language and I'm, I'm asked multiple times a day if I speak Spanish and so would it be easy for me or effective for me to have both sign, sign, you know, bilingual signage. Well, maybe, but that's also assuming that everybody can read uh, or wants to read. You know, even for those who can read, like I have a huge sign up front that says no food or drink. Every day it gets ignored. And when I point it out, then they act like, oh, I didn't see it there, but it's a huge sign and it's very simple to understand. <laughs> but doesn't matter, people just don't care. They don't read signs. And so 
it's hard to say how effective that is. Now, one thing that I do like that has been effective or hopefully will be effective, it's still kind of too early to tell, the Stern Insider Connected system is trying to drive more play to locations. I love the idea of the verified achievements and they also have the leaderboards function. I do need to set up the leaderboard. It's just the problem is, one reason I haven't really been driven to do that is because I only have one game at this location that has Insider connected at my other location. It's only two of the games and so it may look a little odd to have that there. I do wish they could find a way to develop Insider Connected for older machines and other brands so that way you could have kind of a unified system that would cover all the games. I believe Scorebit offers that however so may need to look into that and see if it goes anywhere. Um, Dan W suggested that I should have backlights, loud music, and the store should grab attention and asked what the nightlife is like. Well, Salt Lake City has a terrible nightlife. In fact, I remember an old episode of Red Dwarf, the British sci-fi comedy series, uh, where there was a joke that made me laugh. I didn't fully understand it, I guess, as a teenager, but as an adult, I understood it even better. But uh, Lister, I believe, uh, he gave the joke. Uh, uh, something was happening. He said, I'll be deader than a Saturday night in Salt Lake City. Now, not everybody might understand that, but it goes to the alcohol thing. You know, there is not a big nightlife here. And also, being in a mall, I cannot be open past a certain time. At my other location, it's been very frustrating because the mall demands that we close at 8 o'clock. And it, we've also noticed that just people in that area don't seem to like to go out at night at all. And so that's been difficult because arcades, I mean, I'm recording this in the morning, on a Saturday and you know, I've only had a single customer in so far and you know sometimes business is strong off the bat on Saturdays but sometimes it's like this but usually we're busy at night but even here at this location the mall closes at 9 and throughout the week it's been closing uh, most of my neighbors here have been closing at 8 o'clock and that really kills business too and so if I was in a separate location, you know, an entry fee or a hybrid model might make more sense. Um, and also it would make sense to me to open later and also close later. Um, but that's just not the situation. But as far as loud music, I also cannot do that. That's not allowed per the mall contract in both malls. Um, but it, all, it already gets loud enough here once all the games are on and it's busy. But backlights, yeah, I've actually done that at my other location, put a string of LEDs. I've seen those uh, under lights for pinball machines that I want to add. I've added mods to pinball machines, but would that really make a huge difference? Eh, I don't know. I mean, at each location I do have some laser lights. I, I bought some Christmas decorations that didn't look fully Christmas. They were more just light show things that I set up, and so they'll be playing uh, throughout the day to help draw people in. Uh, I mean, lighting's always been a thing that I've had to adjust because you don't want it too dark because then people think you're closed or seedy, but you don't want it too bright because then it distracts you in the games. So you get all these lights in your screens or all over the glass on pinball machines. And so you have to find a balance there. But again, I don't know that it's going to suddenly cause pinball to start earning 10 times as much as it does just because, you know, it's a, there, there's a little more life around it. But, you know, it doesn't hurt, of course. So I, I agree that it's still all right to, to do that. Now, uh, another user suggested that I try targeted ads to pinball players on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and doing email lists. I've had a lot of people suggest doing email lists. And it's just kind of difficult to capture emails here in this situation. And with the change machine and it being what it is, it, sometimes you don't even interact with people. <laughs> you just, they just come in, put coins in, and leave. And so gathering those is a little bit difficult. But you know, I've tried some targeted ads before. It's been really difficult to say if it's been worth the money. Um, for the most part, Groupon has been my most effective marketing tool, but I've had all sorts of people reach out to me over the years, and I've tried all sorts of things online, and it just hasn't done 
really well. And so Les Doyle, who I whose, men, whose comments I brought up earlier, he also did mention that it's a game played by regulars more so than newbies. That he recommended trying Ticket Redemption with them. I I don't use Ticket Redemption at my location, which does make me unusual. Um, most places out there do have a Ticket Redemption element. However. Both Stern and Jersey Jack Pinball have offered ticket dispensers, and I am not aware of anyone out there that is using them still, as it seems to have been a big flop. And so for 300 extra dollars to add a ticket dispenser onto a machine, I've not heard of it changing the dynamic there. Now maybe that would be different in Australia or in certain venues, but if kids don't already understand pinball, it's just giving out tickets, I don't know that that really works and that seems to be why it's been something that they've given up on but overall that I think addresses uh, a lot of about pinball again I don't hate pinball I don't uh, think that it should be given up on I, I do want to see more ideas like Stern's Insider Connected to help bring more people in but overall there just needs to be a stronger effort to help teach the new generation what pinball is and you know does that mean more digital pinball out there on consoles I don't know I mean there are things out there but it's hard to say if there's anything that's really drawn in new players I think that for the most part people that already know what pinball is are the ones buying the pinball effects tables and, and not so much people who are more into Smash Brothers or uh, Fall Guys or whatever else. And I guess one other thought that I could throw out there too is pinball does seem to attract more men than it does women. And that's not to say that no women play it, but that's one advantage video games seem to have over pinball too is that most games appeal to both sexes uh, for example racing games that do the, they do very well with both men and women boys and girls uh, as do my sports games uh, but pinball it has a harder time um, for whatever reason drawn in the ladies now i have two daughters and when they do visit occasionally they will sometimes play a couple of rounds of something like Ghostbusters, but they won't go and play all my pinball machines, and they usually are playing something else like Minecraft or Cruisin' first before they decide to go and play the pinball machines. And now, could that have to do with the themes? Perhaps. You know, I, I don't know how many people are really interested in all the rock band themes. Um, uh, Granted, I know there's plenty of women that lock, like a lot of those bands too, so maybe that's where I need to try a music band one, where I've generally been kind of disinterested in that, but it's, it's hard to say. Um, somebody else also mentioned Enon, that pins are expensive to get good at, and of course that could be a place where, yeah, the entry fee model is more advantageous for pinball, but again, I just don't know that changing over to a free play model would, just because of pinball would really be worth it in the long run where I'm already seeing things sustain me through all these economic difficulties like I started my business a month before the economy crashed in the United States and I survived that survived the pandemic right now the economic circumstances are pretty bad this is one of the slowest summers i've had outside of the pandemic in probably a decade and so it's uh, you know with gas and inflation being what it is uh, i mean the economy's not in great shape but i've still been able to keep my doors open and keep going and that's mainly due to my video games so uh, if you have other thoughts, uh, then feel free to share them. And thank you for watching this video. I know it's been another long one. I don't mean to ramble, but I just want to make sure that I get all the information out there. Uh, but again, thank you for those who have commented. Um, not so much thanks for the insults on the, the one, but um, for, for the rest, um, thank you for watching. Share more thoughts if you have them. And we'll see you around.